Welcome back to Beyond the Bottom Line. I'm your host, Bert Miller, and my guest today, we all know him. He's shown up everywhere on our feeds, and he's our former United States FBI hostage negotiator. He's an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur around negotiation consultancy, and he's a master class top gun, Mr. Chris Voss. Chris, welcome back to the show. Bert, thanks for having me back on. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Now, the last time we were together, we talked a little bit about your career journey and where you grew up. And then we obviously got into Never Split the Difference, which, which was an awesome book. And if you haven't read it, some everybody certainly get out there and buy that book. And then certainly your transition into the entrepreneurial space. And so uh, it's outstanding to have you back on the show, but we're going to take a different angle this particular time, Chris. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit around the world of work and the talent access space and negotiation. So I'd like to go ahead and get started on that. So what really prompted us getting back together was that you posted something around salary negotiation and the market dynamics that are going on in, in the marketplace and sort of the shift of power between, from the company to the individual. And certainly with low unemployment, more jobs than there, there are people to fill those jobs. Uh, certainly uh, the rising compensation. So when you made that post, I reached back out to you and I thought today would be a great day to really talk about that because negotiation is so important from the individual side of the table as well as the company side of the table. So um, there's a fine line in understanding the market value versus an overreach. And I'd really like to understand your opinion versus some of those people getting some outlier compensa uh, a compensation versus negotiating today what's fair and market value. So let's talk a little bit about that, your perspective. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, it's kind of two things at the same time. What's fair market value and, and uh, what's good price for the salary compensation package for the uh, employer? What's a good compensation package for the um, employee? You know, uh, from the employer side of the house, uh, I'm an employer. You know, I, I want to I wanna give people... Um, a comp you know, compensation where they feel well compensated, and, but they're not, they don't feel anxious because they're worried about not making enough money. Conversely, it's not good to overpay people um, because, uh, and you start getting into outlier compensation, you start getting into a mismatch of expectations. I've overpaid in the past. And um, the unfortunate problem is that people who get overpaid have a tendency to not step up their game while simultaneously the employer's expectations are really high, which is going to cause problems on down the line. I mean, if, if your compensation between the two of you are not in line and somebody's going to be unhappy and somebody's going to get shown the door over it. So the employment compensation is a long-term relationship of trust. You want everybody to be happy. You want people to thrive together. And so the first thing to me is how do they thrive together? Salary is the price term in a negotiation. And price doesn't make deals. It breaks deals. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the wrong compensation. It could break it for one side or the other. But it's not going to make success. And it's not going to make satisfaction. So the sooner you kind of get in a range where you're, the two sides are comfortable, comfortable on salary and you start pivoting to how we're going to be successful together how we're going to enjoy being successful now you're talking about an employee that's going to really produce and because the employee produces the company's going to thrive and because the employee produces they're going to get promoted if that's what they're after or some other aspect of compensation. Like I've got employees that don't necessarily have higher aspirations for their lives. We have a bonus structure. Sometimes they'd rather have a bonus and time off instead of, instead of dollars. Like I want, I want people to be happy at work because when we work, we work hard. Mm -hmm. uh, we get after it, but we, we got a great team and people like working hard together. So yeah. it's a, as long as it's a two-way street discussion, I think both sides are in, in, in better shape. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Chris. So we, we're in this weird time a little bit 
and this transition as we're moving from where the companies really for years and years and years kind of kind of set the tone where individuals wanted to work for certain brands and certain brands were more attractive. Um, and sometimes they may not get the compensation that perhaps they deserved at whatever point in time due to the fact that um, the brands felt like they had an upper hand because they knew the people wanted to be part of the company. Now, the transition over the last few years, and especially coming out of the last two or three years, where we have, at one point, double the amount of jobs open than we had individuals, sort of shifted the power to the individual. So we're in this little transitional phase. And I'm just curious, you know, as to talking, if you were talking to leaders out there as well as the individual, what are the downsides to the outlier compensation? And you kind of touched on it a little bit because as the market cools, you know, there could be uh, could be a rub between the, the, the lead and the company as well as the individual, as opposed to negotiating uh, a, 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 I would say, a more fair compensation into the marketplace where leaders can really show and attract people relative to their mission and North Star in, com in combination with a, with a good comp uh, compensation package. I think that is where individuals certainly need to align themselves, and that's where leaders need to get much better at crystallizing who they are. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree, I agree 100%. I mean, um, and, and we get in a job search that we have going at. Um, the executive search firm says, you know, people are really interested in where they're working. And you guys as a brand, you know, it's kind of cool. Uh, you guys are walking your talk. I mean, that, that's an interesting place to work. And so what is it about, as an employer, what is it about you? Are you walking your talk? Are you walking your core values? I mean, it's a massive competitive advantage to actually live in your core values, primarily because most companies don't. I mean, our, our Daniel Coyle's book, The Talent Code, which I read several years ago, talked about the fact that only 6% of corporate executives actually knew what their core values are. So what's that mean? What, what that means is they're not attracting people based on what the environment. I mean, if, if you get if you get the tactical advantage in terms of compensation and you can really shop, it's a it's a seller's market and you're the seller. Then you're really going to lean in the direction of a place that is going to matter to you that you work there. And, you know, let's say that whatever your product is, is not sexy. Uh, let's say it's widgets. You know, I, I can remember a number of years ago. Uh, when I was in college talking about a case study of a company that just sold toilet paper. I mean, that, that ain't a sexy product, but their culture and the environment that they move that commodity, you know, people liked working together. They felt good that, you know, the executives live by the rules that they set out, their core values, core values. Besides there's two issues, what's your mission? What are your core values? If your mission isn't sexy, but your core values, if you're living them, can still really be good, like team first. You know, you want you want people to grow. You want to figure people out. Do, you know, do they do they want to go kayaking or do they want to go to uh, some sort of um, professional development com conference? As soon as you start dialing into what's going to make your people grow, um, you got a competitive advantage. A friend of mine is a CEO of an international bank. He's famous for two things. Simultaneously, he pays a little less than market for salaries and retains people for more than double the amount of time that anybody else retains people because he really dials into where they're going with their lives and how can he help them get there. And, uh, you know, let's say you want to be uh, a volunteer at a homeless shelter. It's not a professional goal. He helps them work that into their into their work day, into their life. And they love them. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to leave. Right. And they, they love working there so much. When they jump, they they change jobs. They change jobs for big jumps in compensation. Because they've gotten so good at what they're doing. And they're so hard to lure out of the environment that they love being in. Yeah, well, I mean, your point's very, very good and valid, Chris, because that 
that particular leader understands how to help people find out who they can become versus just have a job. And yeah, and, and, yeah and, I mean, at the end of the day, when you take a look at this, there's a lot of companies out there that can pay more money uh, at any given time. And so what's really important is, you know, what I would like to hear a little bit from you is how people, when they attract talent, and I, I have somebody I really, really want to hire, and this individual wants to be in an organization, how would you, how would you advise the individual to negotiate their compensation that is, number one, paying them what their value is and what they're worth in this particular marketplace without overreaching, how would you have the individual do it? And then conversely, the leader, how, what would that exchange feel and look like? Because that's the part I love about what you bring to the, to the party when you, uh, when you talk about negotiation. Hey, um, <clears throat> probably three questions that you get to get answered. And uh, I did a uh, I did a keynote speech for a company probably about a year ago, and um, all the company's top salespeople and the CEO. And so Q and A, one of those top salespeople, it was how do we negotiate with him? How do we get how do we get more out of him? Right. And I'm like, and I could tell like everybody's like scared. Like, what am I going to answer? And so the first question that you got to ask in that interaction is an employee. You look at the other side of the table and you say, how can I be guaranteed to be involved in projects that are critical to the strategic future of this company? Now, boom, instant game changer for both sides. Now, there's an underlying assumption here that is predicated on you want to play in the Super Bowl. You know, you, you, you got an appetite for doing really well and you believe in your ability to grow and to learn now if you're just there for a job um don't ask that question because you don't want to be in a super bowl you don't want to be in the top projects you don't you, you, you don't want to grow you don't want to make a difference with the people that you work with you don't want to make everybody's lives better that question is predicated on you want to make everybody's lives better. Yep. And I remember after I threw that question out, the CEO said, I wish everybody in this company asked me that question. Like that's a question that an employee prospective employee asks for on their own behalf. And the CEO is just dying to hear it because the CEO says, wow, this is a team player. This is somebody that wants to put me in a bigger house, to put my kids in a better school. So one of two things is going to happen. Either compensation is going to follow at your annual review, or you're going to have been involved in stuff that was so cool, then your resume has been really sharpened up and you are far more marketable and they got to pay you more even if they don't want to, to retain you because you've had that kind of a value impact on a company. Strategic projects important to the future of the company. I mean, those are, those are, that's music to the ears of the owners of the company. You know, how do we grow? How do we develop? How do we handle challenges? Absolutely. Now also you, you don't got to get, you don't got to get that job or you don't have to get that strategic position. What you've just done is you signal to top management that you want to be mentored, that you want to grow, that you want them to keep an eye on you. Like you're, you're applying for a job in a mailroom. You know, I, I, as, as, a, as the owner of a company, I want to know the people that are coming in. Like, does my assistant who just handles my calendar does she want to have an impact on a company? I want to know that. It doesn't matter what level you're at or whether or not you're in strategic projects to begin with. The boss wants to know that you're that kind of a team player. Yeah, no question. And the, a couple couple points and individuals out there, what Chris just talked about, how can you, and this is what leaders want to hear from you, how can you come in and impact an organization to help them reach their overall strategic goals and make others around you better. 
And the key point there, as you talked about, uh, Chris, is the Super Bowl. You know, everybody's in the, the, the media is talking about uh, the, the rising compensation and how compensation is rising for, for everybody. And not everybody is really in line to take advantage of what I would call that accelerated compensation. Because not everybody, when if you want to negotiate for more money, in the Super Bowl, the lights are brighter. And when the lights are brighter, if, you, if that's what you want, be careful what you ask for. But if that's what you want, then you have the opportunity to ask the question like Chris just put on, put on, uh, uh, on as he just communicated. That way you can actually work yourself and work for more of a compensation. So next question for you, Chris. So advice for leaders from your perspective to attract talent. Now, we know that money talks and that it's not, it's not always the big kingpin, but money does talk. But in today's talent scarcity market, what are other thoughts on complementary benefits to attract talent and yet be responsible if you're a leader? So let's, talk, let's kind of flip it to the leader side versus the individual side. Well, little things. <clears throat> um, like how do you take the friction out of their lives? And in, in, in many cases, little things are really valued. Like, can, can, can you provide them with a phone? Like, you know, how, how, what's a tiny little thing that really matters to somebody? Cause they're touching their phone every day. And the, if the phone, if they don't have to worry about what the charges are on it, you know, what's the friction for, for taking care of that, uh, um, whatever different administrative nonsense there is on a phone, you know, what are the tiny little touch points in somebody's lives that reduces their friction on a day-to-day -day basis that is also in really small ways is reminded, like really valuable, really valuable to them. Like, if, you know, are you providing a phone? Yeah. I mean, uh, everybody's world revolves around their phone these days. <laughs> You know, are you doing that? You know, what are the little things that take the friction out of their lives that make it easier for them to be there? And we're, we're thinking about that all the time. Um, you know, my company is not a big company. And we recently brought somebody in from McDonald's. Phenomenal benefits package. And what she wanted to know was, not really do you offer this, but do you aspire to? Like, what's my future look like? I know you're not McDonald's. I know you don't, you're never going to, you don't have all these benefit packages. But if you care enough to want to start to pick some of this stuff up, yeah, now nah, I'm interested. So how do you reduce the friction in their lives? How do you get a reputation for being a place that develops people? Yeah. Now, another friend of mine's got that reputation is consistently making one of the fastest growing companies and one of the best places to work for. I mean, he's about learning. He's about getting better. That's his whole culture and his whole environment. Performers are attracted to that. And, you know, as they say in a personal development space, people will pay for transformation. Well, if you're offering a job that's transformative in terms of satisfaction and personal growth, that's compensation. You know, people, people will feel that that's part of the compensation package and it'll make a difference as to whether or not they want to work for you. Yeah, absolutely. And aspire to it. You know, in other words, what is your vision at your company, Chris, is really what she's asking. Show me your North Star. What is the mission? Do you aspire to that, and what can I become as part of your organization? So in these negotiations between the, the leader, leadership and obviously the individual, how can, talent, how can the talent really protect the relationship with leadership once they've gone through this negotiation and they're getting ready to work together? Yeah, well, and there's, those are the other two questions I talked about, and they're, they're – they're, they might sound like um, similar to other questions, but they, they got to be exactly like this. First question is, what does it take to be successful here? The second question is, how are we going to handle things when we get into trouble, when we, when we have disagreements? Now, what does it take to be successful here is not the same as 
what are you looking for in an employee or what are you looking for out of this position? That's a much broader, much more important question. Gives you a little bit of a feel for the culture. Now, in any of these questions, any of these three that I mentioned, you got to actually listen to the answer. You know, you can't be a salesperson and say, what does it take to be successful here? And as soon as they give you an answer, you proceed with why they should hire you. <laughs> that, that meant you didn't listen to the answer. Right. You got to actually listen to the answer because the people that answer that question are going to pay attention to number one, whether or not you listened. And number two, if you get the job, whether or not you listen. Now you get the job and you disregard all the really good guidance that they've given you, they're going to notice when you enter into the company and that is going to work against you. Now you, your actions and your behaviors, want, if you get the job, are in, uh, in congruence, in line with that advice. They're going to notice that too, and they're going to look out for you because they're going to feel personally invested in your success because they gave you advice in an environment that's going to affect them. That's one of the key critical issues on whether or not you take advice. Is your accepting or disregarding that advice going to impact the person that gave it to you? If it ain't going to impact them, there's a pretty good chance you don't need to pay attention to it. Right. So you dive into that for me, uh, Chris. Um, people hear what they're being told, but you're saying listen, not just hear it, but actually listen. So individuals out there that are interviewing and they're probably thinking when they get the opportunity to ask questions, they're probably thinking about their next question many times and not really focusing. They heard the answer, but they didn't listen to it. And many times that's where they fail in the interview process. Right. So maybe stay and help people or communicate uh, for the audience how they can stay in that moment, not only hear what's being said, but also listen to it and how they can respond to it. I, I love you. I love that you use the term stay in the moment because, yeah, you really got to stay in that moment and make sure that you mine all the information that you can out of that moment because it's solid gold. You're, you're mm -hmm. getting it from people that are going to be in your environment. And secondly, it helps. They feel good if you actually paid attention. So the simplest thing to do is, you know, what we call in the Black Swan Method of Mirror which is just repeating the last one to three words of what somebody just said. Or if there's something that's really interesting to you within what they said, you can repeat those one to three words. Now that in and of itself, the mirror forces you to have paid attention to at least three words to have been able to repeat them. What that all first, what that does for the other side is they're going to dive in and give you a more thoughtful response on what they just said and you get a ton more information and right. they feel really hurt so this is a way to really mine that moment for information and rapport building by simply mirroring which is repeating one to three ish words you know if you if you go more than five words you're paraphrasing which is a whole different effective skill but the mirroring is the simplest one to, um, to guide and shepherd the conversation so that you're getting a lot of really good information and listening to it. Man, I, I love the mirroring technique. I, when I use it, it works, and so many times I just fail to use it. Um, so bridging off that, you just brought up the mirroring technique. Uh, let's just go ahead and bridge that to the next question. What are your top five, three, or whatever? What are your top principles for, one, becoming more persuasive in both business and in life? Uh, you know, actually listening is the first thing, um, like actually listening and then making people feel heard. I mean, it's ridiculous how much more honest people are with you when they feel heard. It's two things that happen. They're more honest with you. They feel connected to you and they want to tell you more. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Andrew Huberman's podcast, Huberman Labs like phenomenal 
solid information about human nature and um, neuroscience, actually. And I was listening to one of his podcasts not too long ago, and when someone feels really heard um, and they feel deeply heard, the neurochemical that they get a hit of is oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is a bonding drug, you know, so people feel bonded to you once they feel hurt, which means they're open to your influence because they feel hurt. Now, the thing that Huberman threw out in this particular podcast, which I thought was a great bonus, is if people get a hit of their own oxytocin, they're also more likely to be honest. So and if you make people feel heard, what happens? They bond with you and they're more honest with you. I mean, what more do you want from your interactions in order to have successful interactions? Yeah, shocking that you're attracted to a podcast around neuroscience. <laughs> I'm shocked by that. But yeah, I, I mean, people, I, I, people do want to be heard and they do want to, obviously, when they are heard, certainly there, there is an attraction. It allows for that to be a meaningful conversation between an individual and a hiring leader versus rapid fire question and answer, rapid fire question and answer. Uh, and then on the leadership side, I mean, you know, I don't know what you've seen uh, in the past, Chris, but I, you know, this is what I do for a living. There, there's many hiring leaders. They have their little document and they want to check off the boxes, making sure they're asking the right questions and they can write something about a certain attribute on an individual versus just having the conversation and helping that individual know who they can become in your organization and just building that trust with one another. It's, it's just so important. So as a leader for your own organization now, how do you ensure your team achieves their goals through collaboration versus, you know, say opposition? Well, uh, great question. Um, and, you know, first of all, you know, we're serious about our core values. We talked about them a lot and we mean it. And so we bring them up all the time. And we're, as, as an operational uh, group, we're always focused on next steps. I mean, so much smooths itself out if we're always focusing on next steps. I mean, we really don't even have to have listened to each other that carefully. Because as soon as we start talking about next steps, people are going like, wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I didn't understand that was going to happen. So, we're, you know, we're a very movement, um, progress focused organization. Now, you don't got to make big progress if you're kind of uh, uh, focusing on it regularly because, you know, you know, you're making progress every day and it has a tendency to add up. So, you know, that becomes uh, a, a team focus. And, you know, we're very supportive of one another. You know, we, we try to enjoy our interactions. Uh, but, the, you know, the focus on working together as a team really has a tendency to draw people in. Yeah. And then for me, you know, what I found personally is, you know, in the last of the three questions that I talked about, you know, how are we going to handle things if we get into trouble? Like it's because you're going to get into trouble. It's going to happen. The issue is, have you had at least a, a discussion or a thought about it before it happens? Um, so, and I ask people that question now, because when we get into trouble, it's often, a, it's egos become involved. I'm right, you're, you know, how dare you? Autonomy issues, you know, you're right, you're wrong. And if we've talked about them in advance, it's as simple as this. If I talk to somebody like, what, what, what are we going to do when we disagree, you know, when we get into trouble? And you see things one way and I see things the other. Well, the obvious answer is you're the boss and you're the owner. And unless you're breaking the law, we got to follow what you say. It's kind of like being the owner of a house. Got to follow the house rules. Tell the owner's breaking a, breaking a law and then all bets are off. So if somebody can say that in when egos are not involved, if they can look at me and say, well, you're the boss, you know, I'm going to have to do what you, what you said. You know, they've already agreed that that's what they're going to do. And at a bare minimum, if I remind them of that conversation, it simultaneously takes them back to the moment where they were thinking about it dispassionately. 
their, their uh, egos were not inflamed. And even that sort of a time shift helps cooler heads prevail. So I make it a point now to just say like, you know, how, how are we going to deal with things when we get into trouble? I'm also communicating to them is, with, we get into trouble. I ain't looking to fire you. I'm looking for us to get back on the same sheet of music. And it's so important to me to grow and develop you and not fire you. Let's talk about a mechanism in advance so that my reaction isn't you're fired. My reaction is we can work this out and we can both be better off. Yeah, such great advice. It's really about getting better. It's about talking about the topic at hand, that there's a, what you're disagreeing on, removing the ego and not attacking the individual. And I, I think that is so important because if you can not attack the individual and work on uh, the issue, uh, then everybody's getting better around that. So uh, before we wrap this up, you know, when you think about it, leaders out there, what I, you know, what we've talked about today is really about crystallizing your mission and your North Star, um, helping individuals kind of visualize what they can become at your organization and provide some little things that don't may not cost a lot of money, but provide the little things that let them know you care and, and taking them down their career path. Uh, and certainly you'll have to pay them their market value, but by doing those other things, there's going to be an appreciation, and then that's how you'll build that connectivity. As an individual, ask them the right questions, letting the leaders know that you become part of the strategic um, uh, outcome as a team member and helping the organization uh, get better and making people and others around you better. From that perspective, you're going to maximize your value to the leader, to the leadership in the company, and they will make an offer accordingly. So, uh, great, great conversation, Chris. That that was wonderful. Before we wrap it up, I got just got to ask you, man. Um, you just you, you you contained a rocket, and um, I love it. What is next for you? I don't think you're going to stop. So, what is next for you? Yeah, well, we're we're looking to really expand what we're doing um, on the other side of the planet. You know, our, our, our operation works really well here. We do a lot of coaching and training here. We coach a lot of people through negotiations and provide a lot of training. And the book is sold really well all over the world. And we don't really coach and train on the other, in the other parts of the world because really because the time zone it, it, it differences. So looking really seriously about trying to set up the same model hostage negotiators, business people interacting effectively, you know, on the other side of the world. Man, Chris Voss now going to go global. And I knew you'd have something big up your sleeve. That's outstanding. Well, keep climbing, my friend. And I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, Bert. A pleasure being on, as always. Uh, yeah, appreciate it, man. Beyond the Bottom Line, I'm your host, Bert Miller, and we'll see you next time.